third position, number 11 in the McLaren. His teammate out of the race, but Hunt is on his way to third place at World Championship victory. There he goes, James Hunt, holding the flag up for Britain, driving a superb race in far off Japan behind Mario Andretti, behind Patrick Depaye, but in that vital third place he needs to get the World Championship of 1976. And Mario Andretti coming up to take the chequered flag and win the 1976 Japanese Grand Prix, and he does it! So Murray, 1976, and James Hunt was storming towards the World Championship, mm. fighting mm tooth and nail with Nicky Lauda. Obviously mm. this led to a huge upsurge of interest in Britain and was precipitate in BBC deciding to go ahead in 1978 mm. and go full time mm. with BBC Grand Prix. Yeah, I mean I went into the studio at four o'clock in the morning in London 1976 to commentate on that race where James won the championship but not the race and as you rightly say it set fire to the nation and all of a sudden Formula One became of enormous interest to Britain and particularly with James and then the BBC had overcome the problems about advertising content and they decided in 1978 that they were going to do all the Grand Prix on television with a special program that was going to be called Grand Prix which went from 1978 until 1996 so Murray, with the decision having been made to go full-time, cover every round of the championship, mm. did this lead to an improvement in your working environment? Oh no, I mean what I used to do in the early days, Bruce, was I went out to the Grand Prix on the Thursday, watched the practicing on Friday, watched the practicing and qualifying on Saturday, came back to Britain on Saturday, watched the race from the television centre on Eurovision, as it used to be called in those days, and then afterwards they would edit the race down to half an hour and put it out in the evening and I would have to do the commentary live on the edited program and whilst this was happening and whilst I was talking I had Jonathan Martin who was the producer who went on to become God in the form of head of sport of the BBC screaming in my ears and Jonathan is very good at screaming in your ears and uh, it went on like that for some time and then ultimately we got to a situation where we actually did most of them live from the circuit with the exception of long haul ones like Canada in particular which we didn't do from the circuit for a very long long time but no the facilities were archaic at Monaco for instance you used to sit just behind the armco on a folding park chair with a monitor stuck in front of you with the sound coming straight off the buildings from the back and from the front as the cars went by it was absolutely indescribable at Monza we used to sit in what I call the Mussolini grandstand the 1930s concrete one and with all the girls ogling James and we were sitting in the grandstand with all the people trying to look at the monitors that we were trying to commentate from and I remember the first Monaco Grand Prix I did with James was I think 1980 just after he had retired and at a time when he damaged his leg in a skiing accident and he arrives to sit on the park bench chairs behind the armco with me with his leg in a plaster cast from the sole of his foot to his crutch he sits down on his chair with a bottle of rosé in his hand and he was slightly under the weather and he proceeds to put the plaster cast in my lap and I did the commentary for the whole race with this plaster cast in my lap <laughs> with James breathing rosé fumes over me with Jonathan Martin screaming instructions at me from just behind me and everything going on in front and it was a very very fraught race but things did get better and better until we got to the gigantically sophisticated situation that we enjoy now and enjoy is the word but for all the technology that you have with you in the commentary box, it's very much a, a team with you having a partner in the box. Mm. And, and your first partner from 1979, when he'd retired, was James Hunt. Yeah, I have to level with you and say that it wasn't something that I was at all happy about when it happened. I'd been doing it from 1978 by myself. And then Jonathan Martin, the head of sport, said to me, uh, there's going to be two commentators from now on, Murray, and the other one is going to be James Hunt. And my first reaction was, they're trying to get rid of me. Thin end of the wedge, introducing someone else. My job is at stake. So I wasn't very happy about that. 
Anyway, what the hell does James Hunt know about it? He's a racing driver, not a commentator. So I wasn't exactly receptive to this grand idea. And when James and I got together, I wasn't at all receptive, because I regarded James as an arrogant, spoilt, rich hooray Henry, which he was, and I suspect that he regarded me as a boring old fart, which I hope I wasn't, but uh, the chemistry out of the box was not perfect, is one way of describing it. I was old enough to be his father, and we came from very different backgrounds, education, upbringing, all the rest of it. But thank heavens, it worked in the box. James had a wonderful voice, knew what he was talking about, could talk about it with eloquence and charm and gigantic provocation. My God, he could talk about it with gigantic provocation. And his calm, relaxed, expert attitude contrasted with my trousers on fire, jumping about in the box, pointing at the screen, and all the rest of it. And we made a very good partnership, which lasted for 13 years. 13 years, 16 times a year, four days at a time is a long time, and you get to know each other pretty well. And over the years, I wouldn't be saying all this to you now if it hadn't ended very happily, because over the years, either he changed or I changed, or we both changed, but we got on very well together, and it was a major, major tragedy for his family, the sport, and television viewers worldwide when he very sadly died at the very early age of 45. Well, Ricardo Prezzi now has all the pressure off, only has the screws around his face, and he's sliding and he's lost it! Zero, zero, zero. Can he keep the engine running? Because he can still win the race if he can just get the car going again. And it's obviously getting very, very slippery out there. We saw a neg... There goes Peroni through into the lead. Peroni now takes the lead. Didier Pironi leads and Patrese is stalled. Well, incredible. Uno, numero uno is the signal that he gets from the marshal. Well, I've been very lucky, Bruce, in that I haven't just had one good partner. I've had three good partners because um, Jonathan Palmer did an absolutely sterling job, ex-Formula One racing driver, gigantically eloquent, enormously authoritative, worked like a beaver, knew what he was talking about, and, and we worked well together. And now, of course, I'm working with Martin Brundle, who is turning out to be another James Hunt. With having a former racing driver in the commentary box mm. with you, are the roles clearly delineated? You do the straight commentary and they do the expert? Broadly speaking, I do the commentary and they do the comment because I can't talk about what it's like during a race inside a Formula One car. I've never driven in a race in a Formula One car. Uh, and they have. They know what they're talking about. So if you're doing your jobs properly, you complement each other. But Murray, you say you haven't driven a Formula One car. That's not strictly true, because you track tested a McLaren at Silverstone in the early 80s. Yes, I did. Uh, I was <clears throat> having lunch somewhere once, and Ron Dennis was there, the boss of McLaren. Have you ever driven a Formula One car, Murray? He said, uh, no, I haven't, Ron. He said, uh, would you like to? And I said, yeah, of course I'd like to. And he said, well, I'll get in touch with you. And I thought, oh yeah, I should go, I've heard all this before. Uh, would you like to come and spend the weekend with us at our apartment in Nice, Murray? Yes, I'd love to, and you never hear another thing. But uh, one day the telephone rings, I'm in the office as usual, Bruce, and the telephone rings, and uh, it's Ron, Murray. Yes? If you can get to Silverstone on Thursday, you're on for a drive. God, I thought I felt So I got on my BMW motorcycle, and I rode up to Silverstone, and uh, Ron gives me a large duffel bag which contained a set of Nicky Lauder's overalls, two pairs of racing boots, one size 9, one size 10, typically Ron because no detail is uncovered. I'd got my own crash helmet because I'd ridden up on the bike and he said get, get into that lot and we'll put you in the car. Now the background to this story is that I was actually there for a Formula One test day, Goodyear test day and all the drivers and mechanics were there and they were saying things like uh, looking forward to the lunch hour Murray why, why is that then I said oh you know 
and then it suddenly struck me I thought my god I'm going to be out in a Formula One car for the first time in front of all these people that I've been rubbishing for years are they going to enjoy this so uh, I get in the car James was there as my tutor and he said there's one or two things you ought to know Murray um, one is that you mustn't go off two is that uh, you mustn't stall it and the third thing is that when you come into the pitch you must always stop at the right place at your team not somewhere else because if you stop in the wrong place the mechanics have got to run down the pit lane and push you and they, they're not too keen on that so I get in the car revved it up and I shot out of the pitch like a cork out of a bottle did my exploratory lap came in while they were fixing a camera to the car because the BBC were covering this the second time Bruce I stalled it and needless to say that's the clip they always show on television I'm just about to enjoy my first drive in a Formula 1 car Zoom, and I stalled it well Murray, best of luck <laughs> thank you James, I'm going to need it I think and make sure you entertain us <laughs> <laughs> But I go around and uh, I did 10 laps and when I came in I realised to my horror that Ken Tyrrell was standing alongside me. And I thought, oh my god, I've stopped at the Tyrrell pit and not the McLaren one. And I started to get out of the car and Ken loomed over me and he said, don't move. So I sank back into the cockpit and he said, when you're told to come in, you bloody come in, do you understand? And they'd been holding out the come in sign for about five laps and I'd been so intent on getting around cops I hadn't seen it. But it was a fabulous experience and when I finally got out of the car, in my Nicky Lauda overalls, which I'm glad to say fitted me, to do the champagne spraying bit with Nicky Lauda and John Watson, on the second and third steps of the podium and I was on the top step with my laurel wreath and Nicky and I said don't let any of the champagne get on the overalls because it stinks and you have to wash them for two days to get it clear again uh, I realised what a very very lucky man I'd done I'd done something that very few racing drivers do if you think about it the only time you get to drive a Formula 1 car is when you get into Formula 1 and not many people do that but I've done it 15.6, 1 minute 15.6 seconds for a lap, that's only a second over the lap record, they've certainly got a great sense of humour, these McLaren chaps, more like a minute 55 I'd say. No, no, I think that was the accurate time Murray, it was 15.6 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, but now it's all over, they've shown me the come in board, but hello, what's this? I'm with McLaren and there's Ken Tyrrell, the ace talent spotter, waiting for me, perhaps he wants to sign me up. There you are, there you are. Don't move. Don't move and next time come in with your toes. Yes, sir. <laughs> Three times. Sorry, you could have run out of pictures. Oh, boy, you could get to like this, couldn't you? <laughs> well done. Well, the thing that amazes me, James, is how incredibly precise it is because you just turn the steering wheel, you don't turn the steering wheel, you just move it a fraction and the whole car darts about and you can feel it shaking all around you. The noise isn't nearly as much as I expected it to be, to be quite honest. The response to the accelerator is, when you're used to driving the sort of cooking motor cars I'm used to driving, is absolutely unbelievable. Just like, it's like being in a catapult, like I imagine being in a catapult is. You just go, wham, straight forward, like that. <laughs> Bruce, I, ju I just remembered that when I came in, James said to me, well done Murray, he said, you've done something that every Grand Prix driver would give his eye teeth to do. I said, oh have I really James, that's jolly good, what's that then? He said, you've improved your lap time by half a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an example of the great prestige and advantage of your job, but also it clearly by then, this was 1983, showed the improvement in your working relationship yes, with James yeah, and the affection yeah. you felt. I look back now and I'm remembering it all, I look back to our association with great affection and enormous respect. I mean James was an eccentric but he had charm coming out of his hair roots, he had a wonderful sense of humour, 
he had a gigantically positive attitude to everything and you're right we did work well together do any particular events with James stand out? Because you're always known as someone who's very diligent and goes and does their homework, where James is uh, more notorious for rolling in well, the last James, second. Well, James was a lazy devil. He didn't do any work in the sense that I was doing work. And I'm, I'm not saying that piously. We did things very different ways. James was just sitting around in the paddock talking to people, which of course is the best possible way you can find out what is going on. And because he was James Hunt, and because he had this endearing, charming personality, people beat a path to his door to talk to him and tell him what was going on. And I remember the, the occasion when James came in. James would normally arrive in the commentary box uh, a maximum of five minutes before the race began and that might well have been the first time I'd seen him that weekend and when the race finished it was as though he'd got a spring up his backside which was connected with the chequered flag because the moment the flag went down James went up and out of the box and that was the last you saw of him but I remember on one occasion he came in and just before the race he said uh, I've got to get this in quickly. Senna has just promised that he'll drive for Williams for nothing next year if he gets the opportunity. Well, I now realise that this was the very crafty Ayrton Senna, who was so politically astute, realising that if he dropped this pearl of wisdom into James Hunt's ear, James would broadcast it to the world instantaneously, and Senna would be able to wind Frank Williams up to increase his money chances for next year. And that is exactly what happened. But that's the sort of thing that was happening with James all the time. And I remember on, on one occasion, live during the commentary, as James says, uh, the trouble with Jerry is he's a French Wally, always has been and always will be. Thank you, James, I said, uh, we'll let you know, and carried on with the commentary. But, an but another thing, uh, now that you've got me going, Bruce, is that the atmosphere in the box with James and I could often, often be electric, because we shared one microphone between the two of us. And, of course, whoever hadn't got the microphone thought he ought to have it, because if you're not an extrovert wanting to communicate as a commentator, then you shouldn't be doing the job. And uh, on one occasion, I was bubbling away, and James obviously thought I'd been going on too long. And he gives the wire. I stand up, and he was sat down. Uh, he gives the wire a tremendous tug, and the microphone flew out of my hands. And he, James caught it and carried on talking. And I was absolutely furious at this. And the adrenaline was flying, and I actually had my fist drawn back to to hit it, sitting down in front of me. And I looked across, and Mark Wilkin, the producer, was standing there, and he was just wagging his finger at me, and I, and I, and I didn't do it. Uh, but I always knew with James that if things were flagging a bit, if it wasn't a particularly exciting race, all I had to do was to say something complimentary about Patrese, Piquet, Prost or Mansell, who were four of his pet aversions, and he would gesticulate for the microphone, and I would give him the microphone, and then he would launch into a tirade about how incompetent or useless he thought they were, and it, and it got things going again. And there was never a dull moment with him. But in certain races, such as the 1982 Monaco Grand Prix, where it seemed no one wanted to win the race, they get, everyone who took the lead in a dying lap seemed to crash out. It, the relationship between you and James worked, worked beautifully. And there goes Patrese. Patrese's on the move again. Very fast, but no hope of catching Pironi, who goes into the tunnel for the last... Is that Pironi? Stationary? It is! My goodness! The third leader in two laps! He must have run out of petrol. There's a big problem for uh, the, the Ferrari engine is very, very thirsty. They have a fuel problem, and he could have run out of the petrol. This is unbelievable. Well, we've got this ridiculous situation. We're all sitting by the start-finish line, waiting for a winner to come past, and we don't seem to be getting one. Daly has hit something. You can see his near-side spoiler is missing. We're just hoping that Ricardo Patrese comes in, because if, if he doesn't, heaven knows who is going to be. The winner would be Nigel Mansell. The Ma and there's Prost. With, he's obviously hurt his foot. Alain Prost with his racing boot and sock off. There's Daly's car being pulled in. 
Well, Prost led and went out, Patrese led and went out, Pironi led and went out, De Cesaris led and went out, and now Patrese is coming in to win, without a doubt. There is the man who, who could have said this, he's going to win the Monaco Grand Prix despite having spun off. Ricardo Patrese comes up to the line to win his first Grand Prix, he takes the checkered flag and wins. Certainly the most eventful, exciting, momentous Grand Prix I have ever seen. Murray, that was a, an excellent example of the way a relationship can work almost seamlessly, but there are parts of your working environment that have proved, and must prove, tricky and uh, rather awkward. Yeah, uh, um, and I've got an enormously enjoyable job, Bruce. It's, it's stressful. The travel is demanding. Uh, physically it's demanding because you spend your whole day rushing about the paddock and the track. I mean, I say that the one thing that a Grand Prix commentator needs before anything else is a strong pair of legs because you're on them from the moment you get out of bed until the moment you get back into it. And there's an enormous amount of mental pressure, of course. During a race, the concentration is absolute and it's your job to communicate to people out there who give their eye teeth to be where you are, what you are seeing in an enjoyable, exciting, atmospheric way. Uh, but all sorts of things can go wrong. Uh, as I've said, James and I used to share a microphone and all sorts of things could uh, happen there. You've got this problem about something happens that the viewer sees that you don't because you've looked away from the monitor for some reason and they think you're a raving lunatic for not telling them about something that they've seen that's interesting. You've got an enormous amount of information to juggle from what you're seeing outside the box, what you're seeing on the two monitors that you look at on your lap chart and so on. Uh, sometimes, indeed, the, the main television picture goes down. I remember at Monaco one year, the television picture went down, my television picture went down, but of course, it's Murphy's Law, that it doesn't go down in the homes of the millions of people that you're looking at. So I hadn't got a picture to commentate on, and they had. And what actually happened was that the BBC producer in London, John Phillips, was telling me on the telephone what he was seeing on the monitor in England and I was using that as commentary prompts to tell people what I wasn't seeing but fortunately nobody noticed. Sometimes you get very poor production, not so much now as you used to but in the old days the Brazilian commentator, to put it mildly, was not really on top of his job because it was something he did once a year I remember one year in Andretti's year, 1978, when we came to do the editing of the race for me to commentate on in the days and when we were doing it from London on the Sunday. Of the 90 minutes of the race, 60 minutes of it was Mario Andretti on the screen only because the Spanish television commentator was so panic-stricken about not showing the leader, he stayed with him for the whole time and that was pretty difficult. Uh, another thing is waiting for interviews. I remember one year I waited for four and a half hours to interview Senna who was debriefing with Alain Prost in the McLaren motorhome and this was at a time when the relationship between Senna and Prost was to put him mildly indeed very tense and not at all happy. And at the end of four and a half hours, they came out, and Alain Prost was leading, and I said to him, uh, Alain, I said, what in God's name do you talk about in there for four and a half hours? Oh, he said, uh, sometimes this and uh, sometimes that, but I do not like to be the first to leave. And I could understand why, because he thought Senna might get the jump on him. And another very difficult thing then, it doesn't happen now, is getting the winner, getting the winner's interview. Because every newspaper, every magazine, every radio channel, every television channel in the world wants to be the one who interviews the winner first. But your boss expects you to be the chap that interviews the winner first. And this is where all human decency and regard for your fellow men goes out of the window and you ruthlessly get your elbows out and thrust forward and on the occasions when it's been Damon Hill and Nigel Mansell who are the winner it's I've always been in a preferential position and I've been able to get there first but it hasn't always been easy.